Morning folks, getting started a little later than I usually do due to technical difficulties, um, but we got through it and I'm here, so come on in, chime in, come on in. It's time for another edition of YLM, Your Life Matters with yours truly, your destiny mentor, Michael Norman. Why don't you share, 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 tag someone and... Uh, we're going to get right into the topic for the week. Uh, we're going to get real this week. We need to talk about real issues. We need to deal with real issues that confront real, real Americans, real people, not just in America, but around the world. And we're going to deal with mental health issues this week, all week long. And um, what we're going to do and attempt to do is try to uh, limit the, the scourge and the uh, scar that comes with uh, the stigma that comes with mental health because mental health is not just uh, retardation or anything of that nature. It, it has it's expansive. It can go from anywhere from uh, just being um, angry to complete uh, uh, hallucination. It's a wide and expansive topic. And so I'm going to deal with it, uh, not necessarily in its totality, uh, uh, but I want to touch on it so that we can get, a, get a, grip, a grip on it and understand what it is, perhaps that what we, we've been dealing with all our lives and haven't been able to you know, put a finger on it. What is it? Why do I continue to live this same cycle over and over and over again? Why does life seem like it's the same thing over and over. So, um, Tomas, bless you. Hey, thanks for stopping by. So we're going to get into this today. So I, I want you to just uh, share, 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 get as many people as you can to tune in, to listen in, because I've got some very in, uh, important information I want to share with you. Uh, again, uh, my name is Michael Norman. I'm a pastor. I'm a father. I'm a husband of 30, going on 33 years. I possess uh, a couple of degrees, one in biblical studies, the other is in pastoral counseling. So I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but I have spent time studying um, uh, in counsel. There's some elements of psychiatry, there's some elements of psychology involved there as well, not to mention 30 years of ministry. So I'm coming from not a novice position. I'm coming from a, uh, a, a wealth of experience. Uh, and like I said, uh, I'm not a novice. So again, uh, at the same time, I don't want to give the illusion that I am a, a psychiatric professional. That is not my uh, area of expertise, but it does. I do, uh, in terms of study, have some, some elements of psychology and psychiatric and mental health. So I want to deal with it. I want to talk about it because oftentimes, the, uh, uh, I, like I said, I am a pastor. I'm, I've come from ministry. I've been a pastor uh, several times, uh, both uh, domestic and foreign. I've been a pastor and oversaw uh, ministries here in America and abroad. And I've discovered that people are the same no matter where you go. We all, number one, need love. We all need to understand that we are loved and appreciated. Uh, number two, we all need to know that our life has meaning. We need to understand that there's a purpose to our existence. There's some meaning to our lives. And so, again, that's why I want to take this week, just this week alone, to deal with some uh, uh, what I'm calling uh, a mental health week. Please understand, this does not mean that you're local, that you're crazy, that you're insane or psychotic. We all need some level of mental um, reinforcement, just like our bodies need reinforcements through exercise. You've got to exercise. You can't expect to stay in good health if you eat wrong, you sleep wrong, or you don't get any sleep. You work all the time. You don't get any rest. How do you think your body is going to function optim optimally if you don't get the exercise and the reinforcement that your body needs? Your marriage needs reinforcement. Parenting needs reinforcement. And one of the things, particularly in the African-American community, we, we tend to vilify those who go and seek professional help. Listen, if your car needs help, uh, and it's made by man, it's, it's something designed, it's a, it's a functioning uh, uh, um, object, 
If it requires maintenance, your marriage is going to require maintenance. If you've never been married before, this won't make sense to you until you've been married, but it does require maintenance. Everything in the planet Earth requires maintenance. Once it enters into this planet, and this is a kind of a morbid statement, but anything that enters into the planet Earth is on a time clock. It's called entropy. Anything that comes into the planet Earth is automatically affected by entropy. In other words, it will eventually erode or, uh, or fall apart if, if not given proper care. So anything that comes into the Earth, that, that, that goes for your car, <laughs> that goes for your, your, uh, your weight machines, it goes for your chairs, it goes for your property, it goes for your house. The very house you live in, if you do not care for it, it's going to suffer dilapidation because of the principle of entropy. It will fall apart if you do not maintain it. So if it's true for your house, if it's true for your car, if it's true for your body, then it must also be true for your mind. So we must at some point remove the stigma that there is something wrong with us if we seek someone to help us sort out the issues of our lives. At some point, I know, and I, I've got a lot of religious type people that watch this broadcast and we think that, you know, it's the Holy Ghost job to do everything. The Holy Ghost will do everything for us. He'll make us walk right, make us talk right, make us sing right, live right. No, no, no. If you read your Bible correctly, it is not the job of the Holy Spirit to do anything for you. It is his job in the Greek that's called the paraclete. That simply means or defined as one who walks alongside. In other words, if you move, he'll move. Just like that. If you move, he'll help you move. If you want to go from not enough to more than enough, he will help you get there, but he will not do it for you. I come from an old culture that, that believe that the Holy Ghost will do everything for you, but that's not his responsibility. His responsibility is to walk alongside you and give you gentle nudges to let you know, no, you're headed in the wrong direction. You might need to make an adjustment. Uh, you might have to turn left here, turn right there. Let that friend go. Bring more people like that into your life. That's his job is to help you, not to do it for you. OK, so uh, that's one of the things that we have to recognize as religious church going folk. We have to realize that that is not his job to do things for us. Amen. He give. I'm preaching now. Uh, so and I don't want to preach. That's not what I want to do today. I want to share some very vital information that I know. I know it will help you. I know that it will help you because even the greatest of the greatest have to at times be count. What, what do you think counseling is? Counseling is simply seeking out advice. And when you go into a therapist, when you go into a psychiatrist or a psychologist's office, you're simply seeking advice. Even the scripture says you're counted as wise if you seek wise counsel. Go to somebody who knows, go to somebody who's experienced and get information. If you want to have a successful marriage, go to one who has had a successful marriage. Don't go to the one who's on their seventh, eighth, ninth marriage. Go to somebody who's already been together, one wife for an extended period of time. My wife and I have been married for 30, 32, November, uh, yeah, November 14 will be 33 years with the same woman. Do you not think that it's been cloud, it's been a, a sun rays, it's been lollipops and and, and uh, unicorn dreams every day for 30 years? No, we've gone through some things. We've we've had to endure some pain, some suffering, some anxiety, but we made it through because we 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 not only made a commitment to one another, but we made a commitment to work at it. So whatever it takes. We've gone to see counselors. We've done that. We've done the work. That's how we made it to 33, nearly 33 years because we needed advice. We need, why is she like that? Why is he like that? Why does she talk like that? Why does he talk like that? Why doesn't he do this? And why doesn't she do that? You know, and all of these things that help. See, we're, we're like the, 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 they say, the old saying goes that opposites attract and then they attack. 
Because what you thought was wonderful while you were single, now that you're married, you think it's it's uh, overkill, it's not it's it's crazy or insane. So I I want to help you today and help to kind of change that stigma that goes along with mental health. Mental health is as simple as listening to an encouraging word to help develop your mental health. I listen to tapes, recordings, videos. I'm a YouTube enthusiast. I'm always on YouTube watching videos to help me transform my mind because there's some things I've learned behavior that I need to transform. But the only way you can transform them is by knowledge. The more you grow in knowledge, the better uh, and the more of a chance that you have at transforming your life because your life is not a product of happenstance. It's a product of your mind. It's, be, it's directly related to your mind and the way you think, the way you calibrate, the way you uh, calculate and all of that. It all feeds into what makes up your life today. So I want to encourage you, hang with me. I know this is not one of those things that's going to be, you know, rah, rah. Everybody's going to be, you know, jumping off, the, off, bouncing off the walls and swinging from chandeliers. But this is going to be very helpful information that I know will help you because it has helped me. And if it helps me because I'm no special individual, it can help you too. Okay. So now if you saw in the header, it says, are you, it asks the question rather, are you dealing with a narcissist? And most of us have never even heard of the word narcissist. But I want to help you understand, <clears throat> excuse me, understand whether or not, um, first of all, what a narcissist is. And secondly, determine whether or not you may be a narcissist. Or maybe you, uh, you know a narcissist. Maybe you're married to a narcissist. So this is going to help you understand and let me, under, let me make sure that you understand this as well. My intention is not to bring any level of condemnation or judgment. This is not what this is about. It's about helping us to recognize any dysfunctional behavior that we might indulge. We may allow into our own lives and think that it's normal. Listen, uh, uh, if you've never seen what normal looks like, whatever you've experienced up to this present time is your normal until you realize or someone comes alongside you and says, hey, that's that ain't normal. <laughs> and uh, once you get that notice, then you can be about the business of correcting that behavior. OK, and, and, and again, this is not an issue of pointing out what's wrong with you as much as helping you to discover it and then correct it. Even the scripture says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. You can, you can leave one city and go to the next one. But guess what? You're going to take that behavior with you. You can leave one state to the next state. You're going to take that behavior with you. Why, is there, why does it seem that there's a cycle of, of, of life happening? Like most people call it a generational curse. Uh, I am not so sure about whether or not it's a curse as much as it is a condition. And if it's a condition, it can be changed. If it's a, if a, if it's a mindset, it can be changed because you can change your mind. I can change my mind. And in the words of T.D. Jakes, there's nothing more powerful than a changed mind. Because once you change your mind, you can change your destiny. Once you change your mind, you can change the very trajectory of your life. All right. So again, according to the World Health Organization, and we're hearing a lot about, uh, about the World Health Organization right now while we're dealing with this COVID-19. And let me say for the, for the record, make sure I say this before I even go into this, that I pray that you're safe. I pray that you've been uh, practicing social distancing I pray that you are staying at home and, of course, not going out. And if you have to go out, wear a mask. Wear a mask. Let's not be, you know, Fred Price said it a long time ago. He said, there's a thin line between faith and foolishness. There's a thin line between faith and foolishness. 
Now, if a house is burning down and you're inside the house and you're just, I'm not leaving because God, I've got enough faith that not God's going to put the fire out. And then the roof burns, but you're still believing God. He's going to stop the fire. Listen, there's a thin line between faith and foolishness. This is how God works. Listen, he, he, I, I remember this story. Here's an example. And again, I'm going to go into the definition in just a minute. I'm checking my time to make sure I don't go over time. Um, according to, uh, here's how I see it. This is how I believe God works. Listen, if uh, take that same example. Say that there's a flood coming to your area and you're just standing there in your house and you say, I believe God, uh, God's going to protect me. He's going to rescue me from this flood. And then the water rises so much so that you, uh, you, uh, somebody drives by and say, hey, jump in the car because the water level is rising. You say, nope, nope, nope. God's going to take care of me. And then they drive off. Well, the water rises and then somebody comes by with a boat and they say, jump in the boat. The water is rising. We're all going to drown if we don't move. Well, you say, well, no, no, no. I believe God's going to rescue me from the flood. Just like like he did Noah. No, no, your name is not Noah, okay? But then the water is still rising, and so much so that you have to get on the top of the roof of the house, and then a helicopter comes by and says, hey, grab the ladder, and we'll pull you into the helicopter because the water is rising. But oh no, my God is going to rescue me from the waters, and then uh, tragically that individual dies goes to heaven and he's standing before God and he says, God, why didn't you rescue me? I believe you. I stood on your promises and you didn't rescue me. He said, well, what do you want me to do? I sent a car, I sent a boat and I sent a helicopter, but you didn't take any of them. And tragically they died. So that's how we treat God. Sometimes we can't recognize that sometimes God, yes, he's supernatural, but sometimes he moves in the natural. And I would say most of the time he moves in the natural. All right. So let's deal with this real quickly. Uh, mental health week. And today I'm dealing with narcissism. I'm going to deal with a host of issues that deals with most, uh, uh, mental health because mental health is not just relegated to a psychopathic uh, or a psychotic behavior. It, it doesn't have to be psychotic. It can be, once again, something as simple as low self-esteem. Anything from, from low self-esteem to psychotic behavior, all of that from one end of the spectrum to the other is, it falls under the heading of mental health. So today, again, we're talking about narcissism. Okay, so here's some of the uh, uh, World Health um, well, the World Health Organization, uh, their definition of narcissist. It says, according to the World Health Organization, mental health is a state of well-being in which the individual realizes his or her own capabilities or potential and can cope with the normal stress of life and can work productively and fruitfully and is able to make contribution to his or her community. Okay, now, this is the World Health Organization definition that you, number one, um, it's a state of well being. Number two, you're able to realize your own abilities and appreciate what you can and can't do. Number three, you can cope with normal stress, everyday stress. We all live with it. We all contend with it every day. Now, it's, the, it's, your, it's whether or not you're able to deal with the normal level of stress. And then in spite of that stress, hey, Josie, what's up? In, in spite of that stress that you're able to be productive, okay? And able to contribute to your community in some positive form. Now, here's what I like what I read here, and I'm going to read this to you. Uh, it's a kind of lengthy, so just bear with me on this. Uh, the world, uh, the word narcissism gets tossed around in a lot of our selfie, self-centered, uh, celebrity-driven culture, often to describe someone who seems excessively vain or full of themselves. But in psychological term, narcissism does not 
mean self-love, at least not of a genuine sort. It's more, it's more accurate to say that people with narcissistic personality disorder are in love with an ideal, idealized, grandiose image of themselves, and they're in love with this inflated self-image precisely because it allows them to avoid deep feelings of insecurities. I want you to think about that. So some of, one, of the, one of the overriding traits of a narcissist is they have a, 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 a extremely exaggerated uh, self-concept of who they are. And uh, as a result of their exaggerated concept of who they are, they have a very low concept of who you are when they're dealing interpersonal relationships. Uh, so they prop themselves up with a delusion of grandeur. Now, I, you're going to know somebody in just a minute when I start reading some of this other stuff. So narcissist personality disorder involves a pattern of self-centered, arrogant thinking and behavior, a lack of empathy and consideration for other people. Have you ever met someone who has a lack of empathy? I mean, now, if you're in a friendship, platonic or romantic, it doesn't matter. But if you're in a relationship whereby you can be sympathetic and empathetic towards their plight, but it seems like when you're going through that that individual has no ability to sympathize with you. Uh, you, you tell them, uh, I'm really dealing with something today and, and it's, really, it's really having an effect on me. A narcissist, that is just like blowing in the wind. It goes in one ear and out the other because they have no ability to, to empathize with your plight. As a matter of fact, while you're trying to get them to be sympathetic to your situation, they'll turn it around and cause you to be sympathetic to their situation. Have you ever dealt with that before? Have you ever dealt with someone where you're trying to get their game, their, their sympathy, and then they turn it around and cause you to feel guilty for even asking them because now you feel sorry for that person? That's a narcissist. Now, let me see this as well, that there are varying degrees of narcissism. Not everyone is going to be a perfect 100% narcissist, but I want you to be able to recognize it when you see it. Then I'm going to help you not just recognize it, but how do you handle it? How do you work with it? How do you help them to overcome that self-centered, arrogant uh, lack of empathy that they display in their own personality uh, because it's something deeper than a, a, their need to be recognized. A narcissist has a, a over um, abundant need to be recognized. They must be seen. Narcissists love to be the center of, a, of attention and in doing so, they're often doing things and saying things that make them to become the center of attention, even if it is a bit of exaggeration. What is an exaggeration? An exaggeration is a lie. Let's just call it what it is. It's not stretching the truth. It's not expanding the truth. It's a lie. No matter how, how little it may be, it's still off Centered. It is not centered on truth. The only thing that can set a person free in life is truth. Again, I refer you to the scripture that says that you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. It doesn't set you free. It makes you free. The difference between the two is uh, I, I like to use Martin Luther King as an example because he knew the truth and the truth made him so free that it didn't matter whether he was in jail or out of jail. It didn't matter because he was already free internal. No matter whether he was encapsulated or imprisoned externally, he was already free internally. And so that's where freedom has to start internally. No one should be able to bring you freedom. You must be free. I just said a lot there. So let me just back off for a minute and let you digest that. If you're looking for freedom in the eyes, the love, the relationship with another person, you will never find it. As a matter of fact, you are a prime target for a narcissist. 
If you don't have a healthy concept of who you are, you become a prime target for a narcissist. Let me ask you like I did yesterday. How many times have you ever felt bad? Now, if you're like me and I, 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 I'm not propping myself up, but I, I won't, you know, I won't criticize me. So I'll talk about my own situation. As a child, I grew up thinking again, that it's my sole responsibility to do for others that and not worry about them doing anything for me. So consequently, after living a number of years with that mindset, it was easy for me to do things for people. It was no problem. You want me to help you? You need me to pick you up? You need me to uh, take you to work? You need me to loan you some money or give you some clothing? No problem. I can do that. But you know what I had a problem with? Is receiving when people wanted to do something for me. I wonder if you've ever felt that way before. Are you such a big giver and so habitual in your giving and in your benevolence? It looks wonderful on paper. It looks beautiful, like you are the epitome of the Christ-like person. But when it comes down to you receiving from that individual, you have something inside of you that won't allow you to receive from another individual. Now, that could be one of two things happening. One of two things. One, there's an ego at work there. There's a, an exaggerated ego or pride level that is uh, exaggerated. Or number two, you have been conditioned to believe that you are not good enough to receive. You're good enough to give, but you're not good enough to receive. I wonder how many, you don't have to thumbs up or anything like that. I want you to hear what I'm saying because I'm coming straight for you and I want you to enjoy the life God created you to enjoy. And so you've got to, sometimes you got to face, you got to face the dark truth, the hard truth, because sometimes the truth hurts, but the truth that hurts is not a hurt to kill. It's a hurt to heal because surgeons have to do surgery. They got to cut. There's no way they can get that tumor or that cancer out of your body except they cut you. And consequently, you have to deal with the pain of the surgery. But guess what? That surgery is going to help you heal. And if you never apply surgery to your soul, the cancer of low self-esteem that cancer of I'm not worthy will metastasize and you will not live a fulfilled life. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now, so what I want you to understand is it's all right to be a giver. It is perfectly all right. As a matter of fact, you're the best of us if you are one prone to give. That's wonderful, but be aware that it, even the scripture says it's more blessed to give than to receive. But at the same time, it's not saying that it is not a blessing to receive because sometimes we, I, like I was, and I, once again, I'll use myself as an example. I was so used to giving, so used to giving and, and, and that I, I had a problem receiving. People would want to do things for me and I, I feel guilty. I would want to do things for myself and I would feel guilty. I had a gift uh, as a musician. I started playing right around six or seven years of age and uh, coming up in the old holiness church. And they told me uh, that you shouldn't get paid. You shouldn't get paid for playing because what did you pay for that gift? You freely got it, then you should freely give it. Now, I understand that concept. But uh, uh, I had to grow up and realize even the scripture says that a, a workman is worthy, is worthy of his hire. In other words, if he works, he needs to be paid no matter what they do. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So that no matter what, where, where you are, no matter what you've done, uh, you should get paid for it. So then, I, But I lived under a mindset that said it was wrong for me to receive. And so that made me a potential target for a narcissist. If you're like that, you become a potential target. So what I'm saying is, if you're living with a narcissist or if you're in a relationship with a narcissist, uh, whether it's a romantic 
or um, marriage or a work relationship, where this is generally exhibited is usually in the workplace. It's usually in management and particularly upper management because they don't have the, the empathy to feel what you're going through. And so they will fire you. They let you go or you'll never be good enough. You, 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 you got a project and they say that project is due in 14 days. 14 days goes by. And you've got a project and you present it. Say, I put my blood, sweat and tears into it. Here it is. And they tell you, hmm, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. And so consequently, you get on that treadmill of trying to please trying to please, being pleaser, that need to please, that need, if I don't get that, that, that thumbs up, if I don't get that heart, if I don't get that, that's the way, that's the way to go, that's it, that's it, I'm proud of you, that uh, we don't feel as though we're doing anything because we have a need to please. I'm not saying that you shouldn't do excellent work, but I am saying recognize it when it becomes a condition that affects your life, okay? So, uh, Let's see. Let me give you some headlines. Narcissist lives in a fantasy world that supports their own delusion of grandeur. Since reality doesn't support their grandiose views of themselves, a narcissist lives in a fantasy world propped up by distortion of self-deception and magical thinking. Narcissist has a sense of superiority. Like a balloon that gradually loses air without a steady stream of applause and recognition to keep it inflated. So they have to always be celebrated. You have to always feed their ego. If you're in a relationship where you always have to give compliments and never receive compliments, where you always have to give help, but you never receive help, most likely you are in some form of a narcissist relationship. Here's one more. Now, this one is, is, is way general, but it is a characteristic trait of a narcissist. And that is they possess a sense of entitlement. Now, let me break this down for you. Have you, if you have children or a child and you decided because my upbringing was so hard I had to work so hard as a child. I had to work so hard as a teenager. My parents never did anything for me. They never told me they loved me. They never helped me. They never did anything. I had to work so hard and I grew up in almost a, a neglectful household. And you decide in your mind, when I have my child, I'm going to make sure that they don't grow up the way that I grew up. Not knowing and realizing that what you went through gave you the fortitude and the strength and the tenacity to make it in life, that's why you're successful. That's why you're a CEO. That's why you have your own business. That's why you're still thriving. Everybody else is failing because you had to deal with what you dealt with growing up. But what happens is we decide, I will never let my child go through what I went through as a child. And then we, we go on to provide them with everything they could ever want. Before they even need it, you're going to give it to them. And what that does is you are creating a baby narcissist because what happens is as they grow up under that sort of circumstance where you're always providing for them without them having to do anything to deserve it. It's only because I've grown up like this and I want to make sure my child never have to go through and never wants for anything. Well, guess what? You better be careful with that because you are creating a scenario for a narcissist that will once again grow up with a sense of entitlement. Let me ask you this. No hands, please. That child that you always provided for, always made sure they had the latest shoes, the latest sneakers, the latest fad, the, the uh, Playstations or Xbox and had everything they ever wanted growing up. And then they get into their adult years and they try to make you feel guilty for not paying their rent or not paying their mortgage or not helping them. And they turn around and blame you for the lack of success in their lives. Wonder if you've ever dealt with that before. You know what that is? 
That is called a sense of entitlement. Okay, so they've dealt with that. They've gotten used to people doing things for them without requiring anything from them. See, there's nothing wrong with doing things for your child, but you've got to put a requirement on them. They've got to perform to a certain level. Otherwise, they will grow up with a sense of entitlement. That's why they're lazy. <laughs> Somebody mad at me right now. I'm, I might be talking about your son or your daughter, but let, trust me, if you'll go back and listen to this again and rehearse this in your mind, this may save you countless thousands of dollars, heartaches, sleepless nights, anxiety, and all the rest. Because if you, the best thing you can do for that individual is help them to learn to become self-sufficient and not with a sense of entitlement. Okay? Uh, they, the, another trait, and then I've got to, let's see. Okay. All right, so I got two more things. Three more. They know how to exploit others without guilt or shame. They know how to take from others. Some of your most your bullies in life, the ones that are always intimidating, bullying people around, and it shows up everywhere from the pulpit to the to the boardroom, from the corporate to the church, from the sacred to the secular. You've got preachers. You've got pastors, you've got overseers are just guilty of the same thing. Listen, if you've ever joined a church freely and you decide to leave that church, you should be able to leave that church with the same level of freedom without being made to feel as though God's going to strike you dead if you leave my church. I'm just saying, moving right along. Number, uh, uh, next one, frequently demands uh uh, and de intimidates the bullies and they belittle others. They know how to make you feel less than them. They know how to do it seductively, but you have to be aware of it. And last one, I want to encourage you, don't fall for the fantasy. Narcissists can be very magnetic and charming. This is the thing about them. Most abusive husbands or wives uh, are almost classic examples of a narcissist. Because they can beat you in the face one day or one minute and turn around and present you with flowers and candies and all kinds of flowery words and loving words and affection. And, and it almost short circuits the mind because, wait a minute, you were just beating on me just a few seconds ago. Now you're turning around and saying, I'm sorry. And they can be, I mean, they can turn on the waterworks and be crying and make you almost feel sorry for them. And you were the one that they were beating on. It's narcissism. The best thing you can do for them is help them to get help. Narcissists can be very magnetic and charming. Some of the most silver tongue individuals, the most civil, silver tongue individuals are narcissists because they know how to charm. They know how to say just the right words to get you to give in to their will. That's bullying. Now, bullying is not always going to be, you know, being bombastic and demanding. Sometimes it's enticing, saying all the right, right things to cause you to give into their desires. So recognize that when you see it. And then, of course, you can go on to begin to get help, not only for them, but for yourself. Because if you don't recognize it in yourself, then you're going to create a cycle in your own life and not live a fulfilled and a blessed life the way God wants you to. Jesus said, John 10, 10, if you allow me to grab a scripture, the thief come but to steal, kill, and to destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. There it is. Are you going to enjoy the life? Or are you going to dread the life? Are you going to live your authentic life? Or are you going to live the life someone else impose upon you? You got to make a decision today. Tomorrow, I'm going to come back. Uh, actually, not tomorrow. Tomorrow is uh, our radio show, and I'll be at the, uh, well, I won't be at the radio station, but uh, 411 is tomorrow at 12 noon, so you can tune in. I'll give you the link for that, but then Thursday, we're going to pick up on some more attributes 
of the narcissistic behavior, and we're going to deal with more astra aspects of mental health all week this week. We're going to get it done. We're going to make it happen. And I believe that as we uh, adhere and look at these things and deal with it, look at the man in the mirror. And if you can't stand the one that's looking back at you, that means we got to do the work. We've got to do the work. I can lay hands so many times on you. I don't care what preacher, what bishop, what apostle or prophet lay hands on you until you've got their fingerprint in your forehead. It's not going to change anything until you decide it's time for a change and then go on and do the work. All right. That's all I have for you right now. Listen, there's much more to say, but you'll have to join me again tomorrow. I'll be doing the 411 with our core Miles Powell. And then back again Thursday at 10 a.m. We're going to talk a little bit more about mental health right here on YLM. This is Michael Norman, your destiny mentor, reminding you that your life matters. Now let's go and do the work. All right. See you then. God bless.